I'm Joe Devine and welcome to Whiteboard Football Extra. Today I'm speaking to three separate guests. We've reached the end of our Summer World Cup video series, so I'm joined by both Paul Lansorge and Alex Stewart to discuss the tournaments in 2010 and 2014. Uh, unfortunately, due to a scheduling error, the guys were unable to make it at the same time, so I spoke to them both separately. And I also spoke to UMAX's own Danny Sayers, who is currently out in the Netherlands uh, for us to make a series of videos about the European Championships currently taking place. As ever, I uh, hope you enjoy the episode. It's an extra long one this this week, slightly over an hour, I think. Uh, do please leave us a positive comment or uh, or review um, on iTunes. That's really helpful. And thanks for the download. There's no proof that increased tourism or legacy, as some, I suppose, governments would call it, of infrastructure pays for itself in the years beyond the tournament. So when South Africa, a country who, according to Chris Rodriguez of The Guardian, at the time of the tournament ranked below Gaza and the West Bank uh, in the Human Development Index, which is a rating based on things like education, life expectancy, standard of living. When South Africa hosts a tournament on this scale, um, there's obviously always positives and negatives to that decision since the tournament uh lots of worrying information has come out including the existence of fifa operated legal co- uh, legal courts john oliver on his hbo show did one of one of the first shows was an, an amazing sort of 15 20 minute piece about fifa if you haven't seen that do take to youtube i think it'll be probably the first thing that comes up john oliver fifa it's really worth watching he talks a lot about the fallout from the uh, south african world cup ahead of the 2014 Cup in Brazil. And also, not not to mention the fact that the government spent about £3 billion hosting the tournament in a country with extraordinary levels of financial inequality, um, desperate welfare issues. All of that to one side, Paul, if we can. Um, you know that this was the first World Cup hosted in Africa, and I'm sure we can agree that no matter the potentially nefarious means by which the the claim to host was won and despite general issues surrounding those positives and negatives of paying for and hosting a World Cup it was important that an African country be given the opportunity to be hosts um, because you know to my mind the continent appears to have a, 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 a love for football that maybe even comes close to rivaling Brazil's you know so how you know with all that in mind how do we quantify this knowing what we know now how do we interpret this information and think about how tournaments should be awarded in the future and you know maybe about the, the South African one specifically well it's a huge question um the 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 truth is yeah it was extremely important that there was a world cup in africa and and you know Australasia and Antarctica are now the two continents um, that haven't held a World Cup, and I guess uh, you could probably get away without hosting one in Antarctica. So you know when I I said in the in the video that this is this really became you know it lived up to its billing as a global event in two thousand and two. The World Cup was in South Korea and Japan, and you know so it 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 really has spanned the globe. But the the problem with FIFA being despicable. I mean, if you think, you know, uh, of all the World Cup videos that I've written, the only one that really dealt in depth with the kind of dark side of the World Cup was the Argentina 1978 video. And there's two reasons why that one was singled out. And the first is, next year that'll be 40 years ago. So we have um, the kind of, the benefit of information uh, that comes with a long time having passed. So, for example, there's a quote um, in that video from a Peruvian senator. That quote comes from 2012. It, it was not a contemporary. It's something that would not have been known if people had, hadn't had had that kind of massive distance. Um, and uh, the the second reason was the um, the absoluteness of that. This World Cup, unless you did a kind of John Oliver style analysis of all FIFA's wrongdoings. You see at the heart of the World Cup project that we've done as a whole is this real problem that the World Cup is an absolutely beautiful thing. I mean, that's how the 2010 video ends is with you saying, you know, 
even a good World Cup is, even a bad World Cup's pretty great. You know, that's the, the gist of it. And that's the truth from a football fan perspective. But it's clear that by the time South Africa 2010 rolled around, even, uh, well, especially by the time Germany 2006 rolled around, it was clear it has become clear that corruption is at the heart of these things and there are very questionable, uh, horrible decisions made by the powers that be. Um, And, you know, you mentioned the the kind of human development index and uh, the, the cost of hosting a World Cup. Now, first of all, I think we should be reaching the point where FIFA bear the cost of holding a World Cup. That that seems to me, given that FIFA's cash reserves run to the billions and they're a not-for-profit organisation, it seems to me that FIFA's money is not being used properly. And um, hosting World Cups in countries that are in need of development resources uh, with FIFA money being ploughed into that seems very sensible. Um, but I, as far as I understand it, that isn't what happened in South Africa. The other thing is, whilst South Africa's kind of mean results might be, well, are, as you say, in in the really lower echelons of the Human Development Index, it's not exactly going out on a limb to say that South Africa is a country of profound contradictions. So, you know, there is a lot of wealth as that, that bumps up right against intense poverty. Now, there's a very strong argument that says um, what what you do with that wealth probably shouldn't be you know, build magnificent, absolutely stunning stadia that then get used for games that like a couple of thousand people go to, you know. Um, so th- th- there's huge issues around legacy and planning and all that kind of stuff. And the, the I almost deliberately chose to just steer clear of that, um, partly just because this World Cup was the first World Cup held in Africa. And it's like... It, I don't really want the story to be a, fundamentally about corruption and all that kind of stuff, unless you, unless you also then, unless we'd also done 2006, for example, and then we could have looked at, at the fact that that it seems apparently that that was super dodgy. In fact, I believe I this is please this is a, a very allegedly sentence what I'm about to say because. This is a headline I remember reading, not something I've researched for this, but I think there were big questions about France 98 as well. So the bidding process for World Cups has been a problem for a big, long time. And, you know, um, there is there is something to be said, and this isn't a catch-all, and it doesn't excuse... Uh, it certainly doesn't excuse human rights violations, for example. Um, but there is something to be said about the impact on a country of hosting a major sporting tournament in terms of what it does to the morale of that country. Like, we both live in England. England, uh, in 2012, could not afford to hold an Olympic Games. There's this these massive public um, cuts in public fu- expenditure in all walks of life. And, you know, the Tory government uh, ran this campaign called Austerity, which is still going on to this day. And um, you know, was about cutting benefits and and uh, just reducing public spending in general. And then they put t- together this massive public spending program for the Olympics. But that summer and those Olympics were one of the kind of happiest memories in the collective unconscious of this country. It was an amazing four weeks, and it really did provide a kind of unifying bonding effect. So I'm not saying that then justifies everything. I'm just saying when we look at the kind of hard data, it's also important to remember that sport isn't fundamentally just about hard data. It's it's interesting. I've I've got two things to to say in in response to what you've just said. Firstly, um, I I lived and worked in London during the Olympics in 2012. And whilst I recognise that it was very well attended and a big deal, I didn't find it to be a unifying event. I didn't um, really watch it. I didn't engage with it. Most of the people around me weren't watching it. If anything... Um, whilst, again, I, I'm not probably the best person to ask about this, and I'm sure there was uh, an awful lot of very positive feedback about it. I, to be honest, it, it just got in my way a little bit, uh, made the city busier. <laughs> Joe, you can't uh, take yourself as an example in this situation. I'm not. <laughs> no, no, I can, because because you, you described it as a... As a is a very you know one of the most unifying events in in recent British history. Well, I mean, I think, all, all, I think all that I'm is... saying is that I didn't feel that in the slightest. Or, or I'm I'm not surprised that you've said that. But retrospectively, I look back and and I, I 
question slightly what what are you talking about i mean was it was it that big a deal yeah it was massive uh, please uh, ladies and gentlemen if you're listening to this <laughs> and you were in england in that year and you enjoyed the olympic games and the fact that it was here and it felt yeah, like something do. special was happening please put that in the comments because um yeah i i'm not sure i'm going just, out on a limb why, with are there, a, why are there twice as many people on my tube <laughs> Anyway, th- never mind. The other this thing is, I was going to say, the, you, you I'm sure you're listeners right, Paul. discovering the secret misanthropy of Joe Devine, isn't it? I'm, I'm sure you're right. Um, I'll, I'll take your word on that one. What I was going to talk about is, is um, you, the the idea that you mentioned of having FIFA pay, uh, or, or you know, at least support. I suppose financially support World Cups. It's an interesting idea, and you are right. They have they have a what they describe as a rainy day fund, which uh, a couple of years ago was worth about two billion pounds, which for a non-for-profit organisation, you know, as you say, is is a bit of an odd thing. Um, so it does suggest that their money probably isn't being spent right. But one of the interesting things about how the World Cup has been, and and not not to talk about the bidding process, but simply where it has uh, it's it's been going in the last sort of ten, fifteen, twenty years, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's I think it's great that it's really become a global event, and I love the idea that there was a world cup in africa and in asia and um, i hope to see one in australia at some point and i think that's you know a really good thing i think that should continue but what's interesting about it is that the infrastructure in some of these countries simply doesn't exist uh in and in a way that it, it hasn't necessarily been the same in places i suppose mainly in europe if you was to host the World Cup in Europe, which is why they're always saying if the Qatar World Cup or the Russia World Cup falls through for whatever reason, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a very short, short list of countries that could instantly take it on. And I think one of them was probably the United States. England would appear on that list. I'm sure Germany would as well, because a lot of the infrastructure already exists. You know, FIFA aren't bringing a World Cup to England as an example, and then England would of course spend money on it and it's an expensive thing to do unlike the Olympics they don't have to build all new things uh, to to have football tournaments in whereas when you know you take it to to Qatar I suppose is the extreme example where they're building absolutely everything from scratch South Africa is another example where they built a a lot of stadia from scratch Uh, and I think it's it's a slightly no it's not a new thing because this is you know this has obviously happened throughout the history of the tournament but i think when you have that many um slightly different locations in a short space of time uh, that has happened more regularly and i think it, it i suppose it changes the way that we think about how world cup should be funded um i want to take it back to the cup in south africa specifically um i mentioned chris rodriguez before who wrote in the guardian about the human development index uh, here is a quote from his article as well, which I just want to read. I find it very interesting. And he says, We should be outraged that a country with such a brutal history of forced removals has, in order to create the right brand attributes, evicted the urban poor and rounded up the homeless, dumped into so-called temporary re- relocation areas and transit camps. During the preliminary draw, street children were even held in Westville Prison. These disowned South Africans make a mockery of the struggle against apartheid. How apt, therefore, that among the brands that will benefit from this beautification strategy will be a company that refused to disinvest during the darker days of the old regime, and which now, as an official partner of FIFA, gives its name to the Coca-Cola Park Stadium. And Paul, it, it, is, it is difficult when you read things like that, um, I suppose, to keep that you know that flame of passion alive about the world cup as you as you said i completely agree i think the world cup can be this wonderful amazing unifying global thing um and i do get swept up in it when it comes around but i find it increasingly i know we we don't want to tread over old ground we've talked about this before but um it is increasingly difficult to keep that flame alive in between tournaments right yeah and i really worry about the fact that i don't really like the idea of keeping that flame alive during tournaments even now because it's like well what what do you stand for then in that case because it was a very similar story in 2014 you know there were lots of similar stories mm. and it's what are we doing what what are we doing when we say well, this is it, okay? It, like it's interesting because you say you know you say what what does that what does that mean you stand for? I mean the very fact that you choosing to or not to watch the World Cup now either option 
is in some way a sort of gentle political statement uh, or at least a statement of, you know, your own moral integrity. That's wrong. Football, deciding whether or not to watch football should have no relation <laughs> on your moral integrity, you know? Mm-hmm. Ab- absolutely. But the 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 forces which run the game got darker and darker and darker and darker. And, and you think, okay, well, what is there any hope in the kind of, you know, all those FBI investigations and Blatter stepping down and all that kind of stuff? I, I think it remains to be seen. I, I, um, I guess I'm sort of fundamentally pessimistic about the chances of that actually happening because it feels like it's too far gone and, and the fat of the land was too rich. You know, the, there's a reason that, like, FIFA will do anything for Coca-Cola. It's because they turn on the sweet tap, not of Coca-Cola, but of money. And that's, you know, that becomes then the central premise of the World Cup until... The football starts and then and then something happens because, you know, it's all it's really easy to just go um, like, OK, uh, this is terrible and that's it. That's all there is to it. But to not to, to kind of deny the magic of the football part of it is is reductive. Like it doesn't it's yep, it's tainted and it's gross, but. You know, there's kind of amazing aspects to it too, and I, I, I can't possibly weigh up the pros and cons and think it comes down on the side of the pros. You know, because mm. no, it, it doesn't, it yeah. doesn't. But I think you know, I have some, I have some hope in a way that I wouldn't with more generalized politics. In that, you know, sponsors are are fickle, and if viewing figures drop slightly, if if um, you know the 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 Qatar tournament, for example, um, sours so much in the media that there's a negative brand association. Uh, then, I think you can see within you know the the way that the football governing body is structured, the way that football works as a global thing, a revolution within that is much easier than it would be within a country, and the implications aren't anywhere near as as serious. Obviously, the um, um, the thing about brand association is really complicated, though. Because um, while FIFA, the board, the, the agency, became incredibly tainted, um, it it doesn't stick in the human, in the kind of collective unconscious of it all. Because, and I, really this is a very silly point, but I think it might be true. One of the reasons is that um, the biggest selling computer game maybe in the world it might be number two uh, has got the fifa name on it and so yeah the first yeah. brand association that people think of when they think of fifa isn't like if you say the word fifa in any context other than the conversation we're having right now people will assume you mean the game well i, I don't quite yeah you're absolutely right and that that is that is um definitely a valid point uh w- what i meant was more uh not so much the Coca-Cola, let's take uh, Chris Rodriguez's example, Coca-Cola would, you know, want to cease sponsor sponsorship with FIFA because of the negative brand association of the FIFA brand. But if they were blasted all over the top of a massive stadium in Qatar in which a couple hundred people had died during their building process, you know, uh, and that that was sort of repeatedly trawled to the front of, of the news. Yeah, but first of all, not to be ridiculously cynical about this, but uh, really, would it be trawled to the front of the news? We we saw the coverage of the World Cup in South Africa. The relo- forced relocations weren't the they weren't the story. There's a reason you've kind of there's one Guardian journalist kind of you know standing up against the the normal the norms of the story had nothing to do with that. And Coca Cola stayed in South Africa during apartheid, so you know it's they're they're prepared to ride out some bad pu- publicity. Uh, for the sake of like brand awareness and stuff. Something. Yes, but, I mean I don't dis- I don't fundamentally one... disagree that <laughs> yeah. you know that negative connotations affect sponsors. Of course they do. Okay, uh, that's thoroughly depressing. But to football itself, Paul. Yeah. Um, let's spare a moment for England. Uh, and I would just like to. I, I know that the people who listen to this podcast aren't the negative commenters, but I would just like to take a moment to point out that whilst, of course, we we are internationally focused. Um, 
I think most people who write for the YouTube channel or write for the site, a lot of us are, are from England and as such have an interest in the England team. So whilst I appreciate that we do have uh, slightly more of an international following who might uh, crave less England talk, um, I, I'm interested. Uh, uh, so- I worked really hard though. During like, If you go back through and watch all the videos I wrote, there's not much England talk in them. Like, the only times there's big England talk is when they, the England were kind of partly the, to- the story of the tournament. So, Well, you're an incredible international uh, man. I can't, <laughs> I can't do it. I'm, I'm shackled. I'm shackled to my flag. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, scrap it. They scraped through. They scraped through the group, uh, but they fell apart to the hands of Germany. I think, personally speaking, uh, retrospectively, this was a real low point for England, and maybe the low point. I know they didn't do well in 2014 either, or or, or 2006, um, but this was particularly droll, wasn't it? Yeah, I feel like I can't. For some reason, I can't draw to mind. Oh yeah, two thousand six, Trinidad and Tobago, and all that. Um, yeah, uh, t- it was just terrible. England were just terrible in this World Cup. You know, a lot of commenters pointed out that I didn't mention the uh, Frank Lampard ghost goal in the uh, the four one loss to Germany. So uh, Lampard would have made it. I'm pretty sure he'd have made it two all um, if he'd hit the if the goal had stood. If goal line technology had been in place. I mean, the fact that England won the World Cup in 1966 with a ball that almost certainly didn't cross the line probably means they're owed one. Um, but that kind of uh, long-running karma aside, uh, if England had beaten Germany in that game, it would have been an absolute travesty because yeah. that Germany side was kind of young and fresh and dynamic and exciting and, um, you know, was a, a kind of... Uh, the seed of what would happen in 2014 was pretty evident in 2010. It would have been bad for football. <laughs> it would. Uh, I mean, that group perform. I mean, those group performances mm. were absolutely abysmal. Like England were only in the second round because their group was ridiculously low quality uh, yeah. in terms of the the level of opposition. Like four years later, we saw a really exciting, vibrant Algeria side, but that side were really set up to just spoil. Uh, Slovenia were punching way above their weight, but they weren't, you know, um, they weren't one of European football's giant club, giant sides by any stretch of the imagination. And the USA were, were a very functional, effective side um, in, and you know they would they would have a more than decent World Cup four years later. But yeah, no, England were a disgrace in that World Cup. And when Rooney was like complaining about the fans booing and saying that's loyal, that's loyal support for you, and you're like, come on, man, <laughs> like these people have literally travelled thousands of miles. Imagine how much they've paid to be there to to question their loyalty. Gross. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely dreadful. Uh, well, let's talk about something which is uh, more light-hearted. Diego Maradona and the Ariel Garza debacle. I don't know about you, Paul, but I admire a football manager who is influenced by their dreams. <laughs> I mean, admire is a strong word. Um, is it? Yeah, I mean, I, I like it. It's a lovely, amazing story. I strongly admire it. It doesn't seem to be a particularly sensible way no, exactly, to run a football why, team. Which is why I love it. I love Dadaism. I love surrealism, Paul. So when a man walks into an international football, a global stage of football, and makes... Uh, his tactical decisions based on a dream that he had. I'd love that. That is one of the best things that's ever happened. But the thing is, it was a tactical decision. It wasn't really a tactical decision. It was like a personnel decision because I don't think he played him during the tournament. Um, the, the Maradona in charge of Argentina story is an amazing story. I mean, it, it, you know, Maradona is just like a representative of the id, you know. He's he's just this kind of un, unchecked force of nature um this kind of i don't know uh it, very sort of impulsive world that maradona lives in i think um, well that's why if we're being romantic the dream choices make sense because you often hear that uh, sort of cliche or platitude that uh, football runs through his veins you know or, yeah. or is, is in his blood um if if it was and a man like diego maradona believed that uh, why would he believe it wasn't in his dreams too? He, he's yeah. infused. He kind of is. He is football. He's he's football's biological uh, counterpart. 
Yeah, and especially Argentinian football. Um, and you know, they did really well. Like, they nearly didn't qualify. And then there was this amazing qualification game. I'm almost certain it was against Peru. And I think it was in Peru. And there was a torrential rainstorm. And Martin Palermo scores the winner. And, um, Maradona kind of dives into this pool of water on the side of the pool and slides <laughs> along on his tummy. And it's, it's just lovely. It's just Maradona. And then, like, you know, people were worried that Argentina would be kind of humiliated in that World Cup, and and they weren't. You know, they got through the mm. group stages, beat a decent Mexico side in a really good game. This this World Cup is kind of remembered as a bad World Cup, mostly because the group stages were really dull, but the knockout stages were actually quite entertaining, mm. pretty much from the word go. Um, and then and then of course they ran into Germany, and you know th- that really sort of showed where their their level was um, you time. you're right though that i mean I, I remember them doing very very well and um, better than expected and that is one of these sort of interesting outliers that we've talked about before i've talked to alex about before as well as how do you how uh you know do you quantify that effect that diego Mar- someone like diego maradona has on the on a team who perhaps gets further than their talent would suggest that they do you know that they're sort of uh chuffing on the fumes that, that that he exhales and just you know that's kind of pure that pure football uh steam yeah the, the pure football steam <laughs> of maradona it, the, the thing about this team though is they're not a bunch of plucky underdogs who got by on the inspirational qualities of maradona it's more like what happened was maradona didn't mess everything up as badly as everyone thought he might because uh, that team was not short of talent Print the myth, though, Paul. That's yeah, what, that's yeah. what I say. Print that's the legends. Yeah. Um, South Africa didn't qualify uh, from the group stages, but Ghana did. They made it to the quarterfinals. Um, I think I'm right in saying this came from memory, which is quite unusual for me, Paul. But I think they passed the USA in the round of 16. Is that right? Do you remember that? Uh, they definitely did. In I think they play the USA every year, basically, or every World right. Cup. No, I, so I think you're right. I think, I think or that 2010. is. I think that's what happened because I think they played again in 2014. Um, right, but, but yeah, I, th- I think they they did. Because I remember that I, I went. I went out to a different pub to watch that game, and I remember it being this amazing game. It went that went to extra time as well. I'm fairly certain, and it was a very close run game. Clint Dempsey had a good game, um, and uh, was it Asamo Jan who was playing for for Ghana then? Yeah, absolutely. He's the the one that eventually then missed the penalty in uh, extra time right, against yeah. after the Suarez handball. But they were really exciting, and I think there was. Uh, a, a vibe around them for those two knockout games that was enticing to me for reasons I don't really understand, um, and I don't think it is as you know as simple to say. Well, it was, a, it was a, a tournament in Africa. It was nice to see an African team go so far. I don't know quite what it was, um, but I've bookended this question by by asking, deciding to ask you why haven't an African team won the World Cup pool? Which I recognise is a is a very big question, uh, but I just you know. In 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 a couple of sentences, give it your best shot. I've thought about this a lot um, in the last several hours since you sent me that question. Thanks for the pre warning because I think if that's, you, if you yeah, just dropped fine. it on me, that'd be difficult. I, I think the number one reason this might be a bit counterintuitive or whatever. I mean, people would talk about the lack of investment, relative you know relative lack of wealth compared to. Uh, the rest of the world in a lot of cases um, you know the long term impacts of colonisation on those things and you know all the damage done by that but I think also uh, not many teams have ever won the World Cup it's really hard to win the World Cup and actually one of the main reasons no African team has won the World Cup so far is just unfortunate timing so I mentioned in the video that I, I just re- I only really realised this when I was writing the video, but I think it's absolutely fascinating that first of all, hardly anyone ever wins the World Cup for the first time. So, uh, ninety eight, France won it for the first time, um, and before that, you've got to go like a long way back for a team to to win the World Cup for the first time. Yeah, um, and then uh, I it was think, England, I think, wasn't it? Before that, yeah, exactly, yeah, and then before that, Brazil. And the it's thing, thirty of, years. The thing about France and England is they both won it at home, which almost is like a kind of asterisk in a way. It doesn't invalidate the victory, although in England's case, 
actually there was some really dodgy stuff that happened along the way but that's um but I don't think that was really the case in France but they had home advantage that's massive so Spain were the first side to win the World Cup not in their own country for the first time to be a first time winner of the World Cup not in their own country since Brazil in 1958 and that is that is like a very, very seriously long time. So new countries just don't win the World Cup that often. And if you look at... Okay, so take the three examples of England, France and Spain. England, a lot of talent, well dodgy refereeing, lots of home advantage. That, that's, that's what happens. They get a goal in the World Cup final. I'm not even really talking about that goal, but like the way they got past Argentina with when the referee sent off the Argentine captain for the look in his eye, it was just well dodgy. Um... But then, then you had 1998, France kind of win. They've got a generational team. You know, the Zidane's coming through, uh, that incredible back four, um, Vieira. You know, it's a team that just kind of coalesces and, and, and also was the result of some kind of structured building around Claire Fontaine and, you know, French football kind of building a kind of structured approach and all that stuff. Spain was the result of a project. You know, this was this was the Graham Hunter's book La Roja is an excellent read on this. But you know, this is this is the result of determined effort to harness the best of Spanish footballing strengths and to kind of lose the tag that they had of perennial also rans. You know, um, so there's there's a kind of, and then Germany again when they kind of revitalised themselves they did the same thing. And I'm not sure an African country has done that yet to that same extent. Um, but even if they had, just because you do that doesn't mean you're going to win the World Cup. Think about 2010, that handball on the line, then Ghana are in the semi-final, and who knows what happens at that point, you know, it, the, the the dice gets rolled all over again. Um, if you think about the kind of best African teams of the last few years, the, that Ivory Coast golden generation side, um, I think it's 2006, where their, their draw, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's just brutal. It's like they, they get drawn into a group with like loads of the best teams in the world that make it out of the group stages. It's a different draw and they build through that tournament and, you know, the, the momentum changes and who knows what happens. Drogba scores a big game goal as, as he did so often. You know, so I, I think it's easy to talk about infrastructure and it's easy to talk about all those things. And, and I think probably they're all reasonable and important and I'm not enough of an African football expert to know um, where that work is being done well because of course it's it's this this very there's a very typical western trope of identifying Africa as a as some sort of whole you know you don't really do that with other continents in the same way um, and it's a bit of an ugly thing but the flip side of that is so I went I went to school in Zimbabwe that's where like the beginning of my secondary education was and like we were indoctrinated in pan-Africanism you know like so pan-Africanism is an important cultural and political movement but it's important to kind of separate pan-Africanism from African homogeny you know um so anyway uh long short long story short I don't know why an African team hasn't won the World Cup, but I think we should all we should think a little bit about how one of the main reasons is just that it's really difficult to win the World Cup. One team gets to do it every four years, and almost every time it's a team that's already done it before. Mm, that's very interesting. And for uh, for a man who only received the question uh, for a couple of waking hours before you had to answer <laughs> that one, that's that's a very impressive response. Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's about that's about it. Uh, but I wanted to say to you, Paul, thank you uh, for all your work as part of the World Cup series. We've come to the final week now. There were seven weeks of World Cup uh, history videos. If you've not seen them all, you can head head over to the YouTube channel or head over to umaxo.com and check out the older ones. Paul, you uh, you wrote seven videos. You've been on four podcasts with us. Have you have you enjoyed yourself? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I've I've. As you well know, Joe, I've absolutely loved it because, of course, the great irony of all this is like the World Cup is my favourite thing in football, which is one mm. of the reasons it's so painful that it's being ruined, in, being ruined in the way that it is. Um, people asked questions about, you know, um, why we skipped World Cups. This was 
Mm-hmm. This was just about the fact that there was kind of, it, this was a seven week project. So I had to pick seven World Cups and I tried to pick, um, with uh, one or two extremely personal exceptions. Um, I tried to pick World Cups where I thought the story would be interesting and be told in it. In, and they had kind of a, all World Cups are significant in football terms, but where they had a kind of broader significance. And you were also encouraged by myself uh, to do it in a more chronological form than maybe, uh, not necessarily in order, but for example, we were pairing them up with Alex Stewart's tactical videos. So yeah. we tried to find a tournament from within that tactical era to talk about rather than any tournament that's ever fancy. So it may well have been that there were some out there that we might revisit in the future that... that are worthy of a, of a video on their own, um, but didn't quite fit in to our timeline. Yeah, although eagle-eyed viewers might be able to spot the one where I went, can I just do this one instead? <laughs> and then Joe's like, yes, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no points for guessing. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much, Paul. And, uh, and what, what, what were your highlights uh, now, I suppose, of the history of the World Cup, now that we're all incredibly well-versed? Well, um, for me, there were, there were a few highlights um, in terms of just learning new things, because for the, the World Cups before the ones I remember, I had to do some research and stuff. I, for some reason, the, the reading about the 1958 World Cup I found particularly fascinating. Um, there's something about that World Cup that... It, I don't know if I could really back this argument to the hilt, but in a way that it sort of seems... To me, like that was almost the first modern World Cup in a way. But anyway, I think there's a very strong argument that it came much later than that, especially if you look at the actual football, um, which mm-hmm. wasn't that modern. But the kind of structure of the tournament and all that was was somewhat modern. Yeah. Um, I also really like the fact that it was in Sweden and Brazil won it, and that's where they first won the World Cup. And there's something there's something oddly poignant about that for reasons like yellow can't. for yellow. Exactly, that's what it is. But also, just Sweden seems like a long way away from Brazil and a really sort of a different world, you know. Anyway, so it, you can't um, think of of too many, you know, more extremely different worlds really yeah. than Sweden and Brazil. Although I, that's that's not true at all. But um, no. I mean, I the, the moon and stuff. But anyway, that, that's we digress. <laughs> um, my my favourite one to write, obviously, was the 1998 World Cup mm-hmm. because my mum is French and I grew up, you know, supporting France as well as England. And so mm. that that World Cup was just it, it was. I, I felt really like, oh, I can't believe I get to write about this. That's a that is a kind of lifelong dream fulfilled. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me on board, Joe. It's been an absolute delight. Yeah, thank you. I I would like to say as well that I think my favourite was uh, the the script on the 1978 World Cup because I prefer societal turmoil <laughs> to uh, actual football. But um, thanks, Paul, and we will chat to you again. Obviously, you're not going you're not going anywhere. It might not be so, as so regularly. So a fond farewell, I'm sure, from the listeners. Uh, but we'll speak to you again soon. All right, take care, Joe. So, Danny, you're in Rotterdam now, but I believe you were in Utrecht when you got out there initially, right? Yeah, that's where um, we're based basically for the whole tournament. That's where England are based for the whole tournament. That's where the opening ceremony took place. So it's all kind of start of the tournament. That's where everything is at. So um, we just had to move here for logistics of, of, of the flat. But Utrecht's where we've been. It's been amazing down there. The um, the atmosphere there is is something I, I didn't expect. Um, the country's really embraced uh, this tournament and Utrecht especially um, it's just like one massive party right now and it's it's really incredible to see so absolutely loving it right now well that's one of the things I was going to ask you actually because obviously it's the women's Euros and so the expectation would be that there wouldn't be you know the same level of, of fandom that there would be for, for, for the male tournament so I'm interested to hear what you think about uh, how, how it actually is yeah, I mean, we went to the opening game itself, which was Netherlands versus Norway, and it was a sellout, and all their group games are a sellout. Um, and I can't remember the, the stat, but I think it was something like the largest attendance for uh, a European international match. I'm not 100% sure, um, but the support out here for the Netherlands definitely is unreal. Um, everyone's just embraced it. And then yesterday we went to the England-Scotland game, and we went to the fan zone, and that was absolutely packed out as well. Thousands of people. I think the attendance was just under 6,000, which may not sound like a lot, but for uh, a tournament like that, that wasn't really, I didn't really see it advertised much until a week before the tournament started this week. Uh, for that many people to come all the way over from England and Scotland, 
uh, it's just really great. And there's fans from all the other nations as well. I haven't seen them myself, but we've seen videos on Twitter. Um, all the Iceland fans, there was a video of them doing the old, uh, whatever that clap thing's called. I can't remember. <laughs> the amazing thing they did la- at the last the year. There's thousands chart. of them. That's the one. Yep, yeah, they've been doing that again. So they're out in their thousands. And the support, yeah, it's just been... Not, I wouldn't say unexpected, but it's definitely been refreshing to see. Um, and we're we're recording this on on Thursday, the twentieth. I think this podcast goes out next Monday, so there is a game in between now. Another England game. I think I think they're playing Spain on Sunday. Um, you mentioned they went to the the Scotland game. That was six nil, right? That was six nil. It was very. How emphatic. was it? Uh, I predicted seven nil. So. I'm a bit disappointed in that. It wasn't to be rubbing salt into the wounds of the Scottish fans or anything like that. Um, It was a case of the Scots out there, all the fans, they came in their numbers, they were singing, they were having a great time, but they knew that it was a game that was really out of their depth. It's their first international tournament, the team. Um, A lot of the players are semi-professional still, and you look at kind of the England setup, and and it's just so well drilled. Uh, All the players are now professional. It was just... um, kind of another level of football they were playing against them. Scotland played really well and, and dug deep, but England were just so good. Um, uh, but I think Spain will be a much tougher test. On uh, on Sunday, they, they won their group game as well, so it's the, the top two that are expected to go through, really. So we'll get a much clearer idea of, of how England are going to be sort of prepared for this tournament on Sunday. But it was a great game yesterday. The atmosphere was great. I had a Scot next to me. We were kind of sat in an England area, but there was a few Scots dotted around anyway uh, and English and Scottish fans all um, chatting to each other having a great time and it was I think the fifth goal had gone in it was the 88th minute and this guy shouted uh, don't give up you've still got a chance like he was having a laugh obviously but it was like um, you've got time you can score six things like that it was just great to see and he was just having a great time with it so yeah it was really really good I was going to ask you actually about uh, the Spain game coming up. Obviously, if this was uh, the men's tournament, it, it would look like a very, very tough group. I don't really know uh, the, the state of, of, of the women's game in the minute. So I'm looking at the group and saying, OK, we've got Spain coming up on Sunday. After that, there's Portugal is the other team in the group. Uh, it sounds like quite quite a tough group. How do those, I mean, how do those other, to your, to your knowledge, how do those other teams line up against England? What are our chances? Yeah, I think we are um, favourites to win the group. I think Portugal are in the same boat as Scotland. I might be wrong here, but I think it's their first international tournament too. Um, So both those teams are kind of coming into it with not really any expectations. So I think England and Spain are kind of the two favourites to go ahead. Spain are a great team. They've got some great players, so I know it'll be a a tighter game. But I think England are definitely favoured to make it through um, top of the group, not sounding cocky or, or, or confident or anything like that. But I think... Um, it, it, they're one of the, I think they're the third joint favourite with the uh, Netherlands to to win it as a, the whole tournament. So um, the group should be hopefully um, a good test to to see how the players are playing together. They, and Mark Sampson announced the, the the actual squad like four months before the tournament even started, which is unheard of in football. So it's really interesting to see if that unity that he wanted to get by doing that is there. And from what we saw last night, it's definitely there. Like they they kind of look like just a group of players that. I've been playing together for, for years and just having a really good time with it. Um, but they've still got the professional aspect of it as well and just getting the job done. So, yeah, I'm hoping they can make it to the quarters at least, definitely. I'm taking a look at the betting odds now. That is usually a good indicator of, course. of uh, who's, who's, likely to, who's likely to win. Apparently, overall favourites are, uh, are Germany. England yeah. and the Netherlands are up there as well. France are up there. Um, Spain uh, are not far behind. And you're quite right about Portugal. Portugal are... Uh, apparently less likely to win the tournament than Scotland are. So wow. perhaps okay. that, that game might be yeah. you know, maybe even easier. The Germans are definitely the favourites. They've won the last six European Championships and nine of the last ten. So if anyone's going to win it, they've got to beat them. And England beat them in the third, fourth place playoff at the last World Cup. So that, if anything, is confidence. So obviously that's that's the football is is the main reason you're out there. But uh, you guys, you and Matt, uh, who's Mr. Cameraman Matt, who's out there with you as well, you are taking the opportunity to take in the sights uh, of the cities and sort mm-hmm. of, you know, uh, I suppose get the the fans' experience. I mean, we, we, when we were thinking about this before, you guys travelled out. One of the things that came up often as a theme was the idea that when a fan goes to a tournament, if they you know have the time to spend three or four weeks out there, they're obviously watching the football and that's going to be a big part of the experience, but the, the vast majority of the time they won't be in a stadium. So how are they occupying their time? This is one of the things we thought about. Um, and so what have you guys been up to? So we've only been here for now 
four or five days. So we only have spent our first days here in Utrecht. That's where the first two games were anyway. So um, from that perspective, that's I, I'm not going to lie. I'd never really heard of the city before we started looking into this tournament. Uh, it's the fourth largest city in the country, so I probably should have. But it is um, so beautiful. I can't... Um, I can't overstate that. And it, it's kind of like a few people, a few locals have said it's like a mini Amsterdam. Uh, they've got beautiful canals running all through the city, uh, vast amounts of shops, museums, whatever. Um, and yeah, the, that city in itself is, is so great. We spent the day there on Monday um, exploring it. They've got the, um, the Dom Tower there, which is the tallest, um, I think it's the tallest church building or church tower in the country. Stands at 112 metres which translates to 465 steps, which we took. Well, I did. Matt took about 300, I think, before he nearly collapsed. Um, so that was a really interesting thing to do because you could see the entire cityscape from there. You could see as far as Amsterdam, Rotterdam, uh, which is 30-odd miles away. Um, so from that aspect, that was what we got up to in the day, and then we were a bit tired after that. But it was also just walking around the town... Um, people just coming up to us talking to like we had our England flags on yesterday because of the game just had people talking to us locals just having a great time talking to us making us feel really welcome and comfortable um so yeah just that city as a whole is beautiful and we're planning to go to all the other cities that are hosting games as best we can there's Breda that's hosting the next game so we're going to be going there Tilburg will be the final England group game obviously we'd like to check out uh, Amsterdam we're currently in Rotterdam so we'll do some filming there uh, so there's so many cities that we're looking to go and see. Uh, and from what I've been told, each one has a different thing to offer. So hopefully uh, throughout the series, we can give a real kind of um, short sh- show, a real um, what the Netherlands has to offer, basically, um, with the time we've got here. Because um, like you said, it's only a 90 minute football game every four or five days. So we've got some time to spare and hopefully we can show people what there is to uh, to enjoy here. And this is, so you're going to be spending a lot of time filming and editing videos, throwing them up ad hoc on the channel, and also you're going to record a few more little audio segments for the next couple of podcasts for us as well, aren't you? We're going to have that coming, yeah, we'll um, keep, keep you up to date on the podcast, we'll also have some, hopefully, some live streams as well, um, we did one during the opening day, we were walking, there was a massive parade, all the fans walked to the stadium, it was amazing, and we attempted to live stream during that, I think it went okay, the the internet out here is not great, so it's a bit uh, choppy, but hopefully we can set up another one of them so uh, we can kind of give a real um, full experience of it, not just videos, but, but everything as well. Super. Danny, thanks very much, mate. Have a lovely time. And we'll, Cheers, uh, Joe, mate. We'll enjoy. Look forward to watching some more of those videos. Lovely to chat to you. See you later, mate. So, Alex, the, the, the great thing about 2010 was it was maybe not peak period of Tiki Taka, as we've suggested in the video, that 2008 might have been the premier period for, for that you know, style of Spanish or, or Barcelona football. But Spain uh, won 2010. You, you could make an argument with, with ease playing that sort of style of football. Um, so what is it about Tiki Taka? Because I'm aware we haven't actually made a video about this in in the past. Uh, what are you know some, some central aspects of that tactic that worked so well for that Spanish squad? So I think there's there's kind of two main elements to Tiki Taka, um, which let's not forget is is a, an expression that that actually the the people who play that style of football are not necessarily all that fond of. I think it kind of originated as a slightly pejorative term, but it's um, possessional football and it then feeds into what's also called positional play in English, um, joga de posicion. So the two elements effectively are you retain the ball uh, as much as you possibly can. Um, Quite simply, if the other team doesn't have the ball, they can't attack. But it's about controlling possession and and sort of almost undulating the play from side to side until there's an opening. Um, so it's very patient, very probing. And then suddenly, when there's an opening, when the opposition are, are tired or when they've been stretched from one side to the other, this very, very rapid, um, quick threading small passes into an attack and that's positional play so positional play the the simple way of explaining of explaining it which is um kind of the pep style is 
that you occupy, particularly the the half spaces and the spaces between the lines. So the half spaces in in the vertical arrangement and the spaces in between the lines in the horizontal arrangement. So you're you're looking at players dropping into spaces, uh, finding themselves unmarked, and then creating these very quick passing triangles to manoeuvre the ball through a series of quick passes into a position where it is suddenly dangerous. And, the and pre- presumably, I'm uh, sorry to interject, but mm. presumably, um, I suppose one of the aspects is that they're retaining the ball, which is a form of, you know, quite, I suppose, total defending in, 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 in one way. Does that also mean then that if they're unlikely to lose the ball as much as other teams, that they can be more fluid with their formation or sort of less structured when they're on the ball? Well, it... It's not it's not less structured. I mean, one of the interesting things about positional play is that when you watch it, it looks very instinctual. Um, you have players uh, interchanging positions rapidly, uh, rotating their movement. These very, very quick, fluid passing triangles are created. All of a sudden, you've got a player bursting through into space, you know, Messi or, or Pedro when he was there. And you think, wow, that where has that come from? particularly in contrast to this at times um, ostensibly almost sterile kind of possessional build-up. That movement is incredibly rehearsed. So the players who've come through La Masia into Barcelona, they've been practising that style. They've been practising their runs, where to arrange themselves in relation to other players for years and years and years. So it might seem like it's this off the cuff instinctive genius and to an extent you have to have that still to to make it work and to see where the opening is but the actual movement the 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 positional play element has been rehearsed and practiced time and time again which is why it's so fluid and so rapid um so i i think i think actually that the the two elements are not um they're not as contrasting as they might appear to be you know, it's it's very much a a patient build up into an a, an explosive attack, but but the players know exactly what they're doing through pretty much all of that, um, and that's one of the reasons why you look at a team like Barcelona and it, and it's such a, a thing based in ethos, um, based in the way that those players have been trained right from the age of you know six, seven, eight, or whatever, whenever they come into into the kind of Barcelona training environment. Yeah. I mean, it's without wanting to sound too opinionated, I'm aware that that's not what we tend to do on this channel. But this is why I've often thought that Barcelona are the perfect highlights team, you know, because as you uh, as you say, their patience is a mainstay of uh, of their approach. And if you watch a full 90 minutes, unless it's, you know, an El Clasico or something and there's action every other minute, if you watch Barcelona routinely picking apart a team who you know you, you you know they're going to win uh but they're not a walkover you do see that that level of patience and to be to, frankly from a i know it's subjective our our uh what we find entertaining from football is obviously subjective but for me personally when a team passes the ball around for 5 minutes without really looking like they're going to do anything with it I don't find that exciting to watch, and I recognise that that is not um, that's not something that happens with Barcelona all of the time. And of course, when <clears throat> when they play, when they come up against a team, you know who they can walk over. It's it's incredible to watch when they play uh, a team who are you know cited as one of the best in Europe and they dominate the whole game. It can be incredible to watch. And of course, those moments that you describe, where suddenly from this seemingly passive sort of uh, you know merry-go-round of passes, all of a sudden there's a rapid movement towards the goal and you know that's where you do sort of see that that instinct not not take over for example but you see that shine through a little bit in some of the players like Iniesta, Xavi and and Messi but I've watched a fair bit of Barcelona um, in the past and there were I have to admit there were times where where I found it quite dull. Um, We've talked about this a few times before but I think you know we've touched on the idea that there is a generalised assumption that there are some teams that are attacking and some that are defensive, and a Pep Guardiola team tends to fall under the the banner of attacking, whereas maybe for 45 of those 90 minutes, 
what they're actually doing is is defending with the ball you know yeah that that is certainly one way of looking at it and i'm not <clears throat> you know i'm not going to evangelize that style of football because it's not it's not necessarily one that i find altogether fascinating but but i think looking at whether they're defending with the ball or attacking with the ball it, it it's sort of a it's not quite a semantic point but but they are they're working up the pitch in increments and what you have to remember about barcelona is how teams often play against them which is that they will sit back in a low block they will defend quite narrowly they will try and invite barcelona to play through them because they know that if they push themselves too high and and try and attack too much or 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 press barcelona and win the ball back high up the pitch you know does maybe like Rio Vallecano did um then then they they'll probably get taken apart i mean that that style for barcelona works so well because they've practiced it and because they know what they're doing but they also have players of sufficient quality that if the game breaks down and becomes loose those players can probably pick you off anyway barcelona then have to play in this quite probing patient style but it is effectively still attacking they are still moving the ball forwards they're still switching the play around they're still trying to wait for the opposition to to leave those gaps or 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 for themselves to create that moment that they can pour through so i i would say it's attacking but i can understand where you're coming from they're like a sports car that goes from 0 to 60 in uh uh, however quick is quick <laughs> yeah well i mean look at look that, at that failed miserably then how quick is quick how, qu- how quick is quick but it's i mean that that's that's what Messi does that's exactly yeah. what he does and 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 the drifting around the finding space and then suddenly that that killer interchange of passes and before you know it Messi's on the edge of the six yard box and he's tucking it in and you think shit how did that happen and and it happened because for the five minutes before um, you know, the opposition team didn't touch the ball. So what are the examples then of teams who, I, I feel bad for calling it tiki-taka now, what's the, what were you saying, positional play? Well, well, positional play is an it's element. It's through the two, it's right? A, yeah. yeah, I mean, t- tiki-taka, I, sp- I suppose if you were going to define tiki-taka, it would be to say that it, it's these enormous swathes of passes that are all linked together. The 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 stats that that gave the perception maybe incorrectly that that possession is what wins games. Right. Okay. Well, I'm talking about Barcelona's, uh, you know, Barcelona Spain 2008 style of play. Yeah. Can we find examples? And I'm sure I'm sure we can of other teams. Um, who used this uh, used this style of play very successfully, perhaps without some of the incredible superstars that Barcelona had. The reason I ask that is uh, because I think what we've seen since 2010 and obviously uh, before 2008 that uh, other other styles have slightly more dominance, or there are maybe more available options for countering a style of play like Barcelona's, not to say that they're not still a fabulous team, of course they are, but what I'm interested in is looking at that team that were, that were playing in 2008, 2010, and the Barcelona team with Lionel Messi as well, and asking whether they played so well because the the system led them to do that, and that there would be some that would argue that it did, because a lot of those players uh, were already at Barcelona before Pep Guardiola took over as manager and implemented some of these, hmm. these tactics. But, or whether there was just this moment in time with this incredible team who, who yes, could learn systems uh, like positional play, but also had that, you know, that, that instinct to take it to the next level and, and, and who you might argue would have been fantastic in a lot of different systems. I'm just wondering, I'm yeah. sure, as always, it's a, it's a level of the two, but I'm wondering where you, where you come down on that. No, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think, I think there are there's certainly an argument to say that that players of the quality of of Xavi, Iniesta, Messi, Pedro, I mean look at how well Pedro's adapted to to playing in Chelsea in a 3-4-3. You know, the, these are just extraordinarily special players and you could put them in most systems and and they would flourish. You probably couldn't put Messi in in the Wimbledon of the early 1980s and and see him do altogether well, but maybe you could. Generally speaking, you know, um, mm. 
I think, you know, obviously the origins of that style of, of rotational possessional play can probably be found most clearly in total football in, in the sort of, you know, the Ajax of the the late 60s, early 70s and, and then what the Dutch team went on to do. Um, I think you could look at the way that Liverpool rotated the ball um, in the late 70s and early 80s when they were the, you know, arguably the dominant force in English football. They... They played in a four four two, but a lot of it was to do with with switching the play across the the centre backs being comfortable pushing the ball out um, and creating again passing triangles, but doing it in a in a more rigid four four two system. So there are there are certainly teams that have have done it or done things like it, but I think you had that perfect synthesis of a series of players that had come through an academy that privileged touch, uh, positional awareness and finding space. You had a team that had, you know, those players coming through who kind of peaked together at the right sort of time. And you had a manager who was clearly in, in Pep Guardiola. He was building on what had come before and, and his relationship with Cruyff as well was particularly important in that. But he had, he was able to advance those ideas and synthesize all of that together. And all of a sudden for a period of, you know, maybe five or six years, you had a team that were quite clearly the best club team in the world. Okay. So let's talk about the Spain team specifically. Then we've been talking a little bit about Barcelona as well. Uh, We're going to keep Barcelona in the conversation uh, because the thing that I think uh, is quite noticeable about the 2010 world cup under uh, Vincent del Bosque as the Spain manager is that what he appeared to do was take a lot of the tropes of the Barcelona team and a lot of their players and sort of try and, uh, where he could, recreate that on a, on a national scale. And um, I think one of, the, one of the period in history that jumps out at me that we covered in this series, uh, where we saw the same sort of thing, was with um, Ferruccio Vallecoreci at Italy, sort of taking from what Helenio Herrera was doing into Milan, you know, there or thereabouts around the same era, taking a lot of those players who were crucial to that system. I remember uh, Fachetti being part of that. And um, again, trying to maybe recreate something that had been successful on, on a club level. It sounds sort of lazy, but actually it might be really sensible because what are the... You know, what are the obvious issues of international football? One of them is a lack of preparation time with squad and players who, you know, for for any other part of the year don't don't play with each other, right? Yeah, I, I think you always see in the most successful national sides um, that they are building on a template taken out of domestic football. Um, and you can see it with the Dutch side, uh, of 1974 you can and to a slightly lesser extent 78 you can you can see it with um the the spanish side as you've talked about you can see it with that italy side for i mean the italy side played that way for nigh on 20 years um and you can see it with uh with argentine sides brazilian sides when they've been successful as well that 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 trends in domestic football when those players were predominantly all in the same league that works. And I think that's one of the crucial points is that as football has become increasingly internationalized in terms of where club players are, then you're generally speaking, you're not going to be drawing a lot of those players from, you, you know, the majority of the French national side does not play in Liga. The majority of the Brazilian national side does not play uh, in the Campanero. And and it's much, much harder now to impose that on those teams. And so what you find is that the teams where the majority of their players are in that national side, sorry, in that national league, that domestic league, and better yet for Spain, when actually half of them at least are playing for the same club side, then it is a lot easier to do that. So the 2016 Tottenham England thing. <laughs> well, I mean, I, is, that, I, is that an example? Probably not the best. Honestly, I've always figured that, uh, and, and you can look at it in rugby, for example, uh, and I, I know it's perhaps heretical to mention rugby on a, a football podcast, but in, in rugby, you have certain positional pairings that work together all of the time. So the halfback pairings, the scrum half and the fly half, or the, um, the scrum half and the number eight, you know, these front rows as well. If you build your blocks based on 
players who play together domestically regularly, then it seems to make for stronger links because there's already an instinctual understanding. International sports generally, uh, whether it's football, rugby, hockey, whatever, coaches have a very, very limited time to work with those players. Those players are coming out of grueling, demanding domestic um, uh, schedules. They they probably are so saturated with information that's required to play their sport at a club level on a week by week basis that trying to get a huge amount of new stuff into them. You know, imagine if if you you had a, a Tottenham side or an England side that was largely based around Tottenham and I don't know Liverpool and Manchester United say, and then and then you said, right lads, we're going to play a three four three because it's worked really well for Chelsea. Those players aren't used to playing in a 3-4-3. Occasionally at Tottenham it happens. But, so all of a sudden, you're actually spending the, the three or four days you've got in an international meetup week trying to teach an entirely new system rather than trying to get players that don't play together regularly to understand a system that they're already all familiar with. Um, it just doesn't work. So if you can... You know, if you can build a, a, an international side around at least the spine of a club team and try and keep the tactics reasonably homogenous, it, it's just the logical approach. And that's why a lot of people have decried what international football is becoming. You know, people like Jonathan Wilson have, have very cogently argued that actually it's basically just a less good version of what we see in, in the top club competitions. That's fair enough. I think I think that's you know. I think from an aesthetic, tactical see. point of view, it's it's very hard to agree to disagree with him. But um, from from other aspects, from as, other yeah. aspects, there's still an emotional engagement in tournament football, whether it's because you're supporting your team or not. I mean, one of the things I, I suppose, I lament about international football is actually that it's it's harder nowadays to discover players. That, that only come to attention in international tournaments that you've never heard of before. But I, but I don't think that's the fault of football. I think that's the fault of the, the proliferation of coverage and also the fact that the, the top international players now, by and large, are playing in, in European teams. So yeah. they are yeah. a lot more familiar to us. A globalisation. Yeah, effectively, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, you, you, you kind of... You can imagine that people who watched... You know, World Cups in the 1980s, 1990s had had genuinely never seen some of those players playing. You know, it would have been the first opportunity. And in some instances, probably not even have heard of them at all. And then suddenly, you know, you've got, wow, who is this guy? <laughs> you know, this is incredible. Nowadays, that just doesn't happen. Well, that's why the novelty of, of playing friendlies uh, or even qualifiers against a team like San Marino is quite nice because... Hmm. Those those amateur players, I find them fascinating. What are they doing? What is their life like? And there's and always at least one of them is a police officer, which is mm. <laughs> which is always kind of amusing, and a postman. Let's chat now about Germany. Uh, God forbid we leave the Germans out uh, because 2014 they smashed it. Uh, we saw it coming in 2010. Potentially, I just remember thinking around the time when they beat you know that that young German team beat the England team four one. There were signs there that you know, in maybe maybe in four years' time, they'll they'll do something special, and they did. Um, and the thing that you picked up on in the video, Alex, was that the Germans, like the Spanish that came before them, uh, both had dedicated systems to teaching uh, all of their youth players. You know, I suppose nationwide, uh, a specific set of footballing DNA, as it as it may now be known. Um, and you also note that the England late to the party as ever, um, are also doing that now. The FA have uh, have have published their own footballing DNA guidelines that uh, all youth team levels are, are, are taught to, to varying degrees of depth. Um, what was special about that German side? And uh, I suppose it's not really a question, but I suppose you can see the obvious bene uh, ben benefact of, of creating a footballing DNA from a, from a young age. Yeah, again, I think Germany benefits from having, um, particularly at that point in time, two very strong domestic sides who, I mean, Bayern Munich almost to the point of being totally cynical about them, just hoovering up all of the good young German players. 
Um, and, and Bayern have got such financial clout in that market that they can pretty much acquire anybody that they want who's, you know, you can imagine their scouting consists of basically looking at the German under-21 side and working out who's in the Bundesliga and then buying them. So, again, you had players who were regularly playing together um, and there was a very strong spine to that side. Um, it, it was noted in the, the comments to the video that Sami Kadira also played a lot in that um, in that uh, team. And that, that's correct. Kramer actually started the final, although he came off quite rapidly because Kadira was on off suffering with, with injury problems in the run up to, to the finals generally. And it was 50, 50, whether he'd even play. And so that's why I put Kramer in the lineup rather than Kadira. But, you know, you, so you had a, you had a really good balance there. You had some very, very talented attacking players in, in people like Muller and, and Goetze. Um, you had a very strong spine with people like Kadira or Kramer going back to, um, uh, Hummels and then obviously Manuel Neuer in goal, who's you know possibly top five goalkeepers of all time, um, arguably, and has certainly redefined the the position um, in terms of you know where he plays and where he, he um, launches attacking balls from and so on. So I think I think in terms of the DNA, maybe uh, I know I know that the the, the German FA. I, Forgive me, I don't know what they actually call themselves, but let's call them the German FA. Um, made a kind of conscious decision um, after Germany had underachieved uh, for you know a good kind of ten year period that focusing on touch, on passing, on positional play was something that they wanted to be a, a an Im- of importance right the way through the youth training system. Um, that a lot of coaching maybe prior to that point, much like in England, had focused on physical conditioning uh, and that that wasn't the way to create good footballers. I think there's a lot to be said for looking over at the Barcelona model there as well and seeing how they were doing stuff. And it produced a coterie of, of players who were all coming through at the same time who had fantastic technical ability um, as well as everything else. And and that's certainly what, what England are trying to do at the moment, um, going right down to the sort of the under 16s level. You know, there's an emphasis on on intelligent coaching because I think there's a realization now that the kind of blood and, and cons- thunder consistent as well. And Sorry, cons- no, but and that that's the point that's just the crucial point of it being a DNA in inverted commas is that it's consistent. That, that you're producing effectively a conveyor belt of talent so that the the guys that are learning how to play a particular type of, you know, say four two three one, with an emphasis on pressing, an emphasis on attacking through half spaces, all that kind of stuff, that the, that the coaches that are coaching them at under 16 level are telling them to do stuff that when they get to the first team will be the same stuff that they're being asked to do. And that's the benefit of having someone like Gareth Southgate in charge at the top level. And and also, again, I don't think England are expected to 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 win or do you know outstandingly well in in uh, in Russia next year. But even if they don't, my uh, uh, as it stands now, my my preference would be to to keep Southgate because unfortunately, what happens, um, and I'm sure this this happens uh, in club football as well. Whenever a manager is fired, because of course you can imagine. Uh, that 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 consistency of coaching right down the ranks works the same at club football as as it as it theoretically does at international football. When it, when a manager is sacked and leaves, and a new manager with a new ethos comes in, that ethos is then uh, you know is attempted to be to be replicated throughout all the systems. So you end up with a situation where there'll be you know seventeen, sixteen year old kids uh, who have been you know at the at the club for four or five years who've been rehearsing and practicing every day this particular type of football that uh, there was a, you know was a staple of the man, of the previous manager and now the new the new guy comes in and they can't quite make the first team because all of a sudden he's playing a style of football that doesn't suit them you know i think there's definitely something to be said for 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 change but also for consistency without question and and i think what you need to to kind of focus on is the bigger picture beyond the tenure of an individual 
Um, and I think the benefit that the FA has as as a as a body is that they can make those overarching decisions. They can say the way that we want England to play for the next twenty years is X, and whoever we bring in, they'll make that happen. It also theoretically makes it easier to make appointments because you know they know exactly what they're looking for. If yeah, a manager absolutely. comes along who might be you know a big win but doesn't play that style of football, they're not on the list. You pick someone who has clearly shown yeah. from the from the, the history history of their results, the history of their style of play that they fit that that idea. And you, you know it's, there's, there's a short list already. Yeah, I think that's true. And and you know say you know, obviously one of the next big managerial appointments seismic managerial appointments will be whenever Arsene Wenger leaves Arsenal Mm. and I think it would be ridiculous if Arsenal weren't looking at managers that can just continue effectively his style I think that kind of you might be upsetting quite a lot of people by saying that (laughs) well no because I think I think that that there isn't an issue with the style I don't think there's an issue with the way that that they're playing I think there's been an issue in recruitment certainly um and and I think that to an extent you you sometimes need to freshen up the person who's giving the directions, even if the directions themselves are quite kind of similar because people get complacent, they, they get used to working a certain sort of way. But Arsenal have developed a style of football um, that has by and large worked for them. And so coming in and, you know, massively changing that, sometimes it can work. Okay, look, the, the transition between... Um, what came before Antonio Conte and Antonio Conte at Chelsea was a pretty drastic shift. But we say that with the hindsight of Conte's very successful use of 3-4-3. What about Big Sam? We don't forget that when Conte came in at Chelsea, he tried to play effectively the same system that Mourinho was playing for the first few games and it didn't work. Yeah. So Big Sam, yes, I could never understand that appointment, to be honest. We can we can predict beforehand what he's going to do, and then he does it with success. Um, well, Big Sam... And it tends tends to be a departure. Yeah, I mean, you know, that Big Sam's a funny one, because in terms of kind of off-the-pitch stuff, he's actually, he's been a surprisingly revolutionary manager in English football. Um, in in terms of the use of data, biometric monitoring, all of those kind of things, you know, he he was genuinely at the cutting edge of that. He was the Reebok king. He was the Reebok king, but a lot of times his football became quite reductive in terms of its style, and so you've you've got an odd balance there, an unusual balance of somebody who is maybe thinking about the game in the right way but actually tends to regress tactically to something that is much more safe and solid. Unless that's what the data suggests. I, I fear that this is a big argument that we don't have time to get into on this podcast. <laughs> I'm not but surprised. We should, we should go back to this at some point. I'll set, I'll set, the, uh, set the ground for it now. Big Sam, was he yeah, uh, was his regressive tactics, what the data suggested? Did he develop that defensive outlook as a result of years of looking at numbers? Or was he afraid of the wind? Uh, we'll talk about that on the future episode. Lastly, Alex, uh, is for me to say thank you for participating in the World Cup campaign. Seven weeks of World Cup videos. We're all done now. Uh, so the people who hated them, uh, it's <laughs> over. Don't worry. The people who loved them, thank you very much for, for watching them and enjoying them. We we enjoyed them too. And we'll be looking to do some, some more similar things uh, in the future, international football-related uh, history, these sorts of things. Uh, but, but before we finish, Alex, um, you've now effectively, to to a varying degree of depth, covered the period from 1930 to 2014. Uh, can you pick out a highlight or two um, that that was that was your favourite or your preferred uh, from from that period? Um, it's it's a it's a kind of almost a cheap answer, but the highlight has been has been doing it actually having the opportunity to, to that is a cheap to go back and i know i know saying that you know I've, I've had the opportunity to go back and and look at over 80 years of football history and yeah and see things that i had not come across before um mm. i think what have i enjoyed i think the brazilian side of 82 i've really enjoyed um mm. i think learning more about uh, Holland in 74 or the Netherlands in 74 um, 
and and then the I think on that I think it's okay to say Holland. I looked this up. Yeah, I think people were, are being pedantic on that score. They 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 are, and 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 I'll explain why. Uh, I looked this up because there were people commenting on on videos, um, and uh, uh, you know, with the the sort of unwritten tone of you guys don't know what you're talking about, or you're a massive racist um, because we called Holland's football team Holland. And if it if it if it does uh, offend um, anybody in Holland. I do, I do apologise. I would like to hear people's opinions about it rather than, you know, br- brute sort of sharp corrections. But I did look it up, uh, and uh, even the Wikipedia page, which I consider to be the height of academic research on the internet, <laughs> Alex, I don't know about you, even the Wikipedia page um, suggests that colloquially in England uh, is, and even in Holland sometimes, the football team specifically, not the country, the football team specifically is known as Holland. Uh, and... If we were talking about the country, we would have to say the Netherlands, and they would be right. But because we're talking about the football team, Holland is okay. You you crack on, Alex. Yeah. So <laughs> so that was good. Um, and yeah, just the, the the finding different sources for for the research um, has also been really interesting. And I, I would always urge people who uh, want to know more about stuff, because obviously, as as we've talked about before. Um, and I think here very specifically of Croatia 98, we can't always go into the level of depth that we would like to um, because mm. of time constraints and because of, of simply the practicalities of making these videos, which are really long, quite arduous processes. Um, so if anybody is ever interested in stuff that we've not covered in the same depth, rather than leaving a, a slightly whingy comment on the YouTube video, why not get in touch with me and say, hey, I would like to know more about this. Where can I find stuff out? Because I've got a huge library of, of football books that I draw on for research, as well as other resources. Um, a huge library. On, honestly, to the point where my girlfriend is is instituting a, a one in, two out policy on books in our flat. Goodness me. Yeah. Well, there you go, She's listeners. Militant. One in, two out. There's opportunities for you to get your hands on some free books, it sounds like. No, I'll be getting rid of uh, of other things first. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm always... <laughs> is your girlfriend to come and <laughs> Um, I'm always happy. She's to... not. She's not an object. Let's not objectify women on this podcast, Alex. No, I don't. I don't think we're doing that. Um, yeah, I'm always happy to to point people in the direction of places where I've found um, useful material. So just just drop us a line and, and ask. Mm, indeed. Uh, well, Alex, thanks very much. Uh, you are a, a regular staple of the channel, anyway. So no doubt we'll see you back here. This podcast ends soon. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, of course, thanks to Paul, and thanks to everybody who watched uh, the, the the episodes. This has been an extra long podcast, so thank you to you specifically if you've made it all the way through. I think we're at over an hour now. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll chat to you all next week. Thanks, Alex. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.